hosts and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 40 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew illustrates the power of God's Word to change our lives in his teaching, The Word Became Flesh. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series entitled, The Word Became Flesh. Tomorrow's going to be my very last day to offer any of this teaching over our television broadcast. I've been on this for five weeks, and I tell you, we've still got some great things to say today and tomorrow, but I want to encourage you to please get these materials. They'd be a blessing to you. They'd be a blessing to other people. And I'm just trying to reach as many people as I possibly can. And it would be a, a great blessing if you would get these materials and not only receive it for yourself, but share it with someone. I guarantee you this would change people's lives. We today are in Colossians chapter 2, and I ended yesterday with verse 12. And basically what I've been saying the last few days, Paul is just trying to get the people to recognize what they have in Christ, that it's not what they can have but what they already have. The Christian life isn't learning how to get God to do something. It's learning what God has already done when you became born again. Everything that you need, the fullness of the Godhead, dwells in Jesus bodily, and Jesus dwells in you if you are born again. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Boy, these are some of the powerful truths that we've been talking about. In verse 13, he says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Notice it says, hath he quickened. It's already been done. But there are some powerful statements here. He says that you were dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You know, most people don't really understand this. Most people look at things only from a physical, external realm, and they think, I wasn't dead before I got saved. Well, not physically, but emotionally, spiritually, we were all really dead. And some people think, oh, not me. I was living a pretty good life. You know, Jesus was just the icing on the cake. If a person says something like that, I seriously wonder whether they've been born again. Because the truth is, compared to the life that we now have in Christ, anything, I don't care if you are the best sinner, that's breathing on the earth today. Your existence is death compared to what we receive through Christ. And if you don't have that contrast, if you don't see that difference in before and after your born-again experience, then I seriously wonder whether you got born again or whether you just became religious. That's not said to hurt anybody. I believe it's the truth. Here's another way. Paul, the same writer, said this in Ephesians chapter 2, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. These verses say that you were dead before you got born again, and you were also controlled by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You know, this is not really politically correct or popular, but it's scripturally correct, and that is that people who don't know Jesus are under the influence of the devil, a spirit, the prince of the power of the air that works in the children of disobedience. And I know that that's not politically correct, and some people take offense at this, but that just shows how far people have fallen from where God intended us to be. You know, God created Adam and Eve, and they were in perfection. God never intended for the murder, for the adultery, the strife, the lying, the stealing, the dishonesty, the homosexuality, the, um, all of the things that go on in this world. We have grown up in a culture that we look around, and if a person, you know, hasn't gone to jail, if you haven't been committed of some major offense, you know, you may have committed adultery a number of times, you may lie still, you get mad, you get angry, you're depressed, you're all of this, but because you are relatively compared to all of the other sinners, okay, we get to thinking that I'm really good. Did you know that a person who's not born again, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, you are being controlled by the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit 
that works in people before they get born again. I guarantee you the lust, the desires, the anger, the bitterness, the jealousy, all of the things that go on, it's not the way God intended people to be. It is a manifest token and uh, presence of demonic power operating in people. And we've just become so accustomed to it that we don't recognize it. But anyway, I could preach on that for a long time. But going back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, you were dead in your sins. If you don't recognize that, if you haven't forsaken that old life and come alive in Christ and recognize that we now have life as contrasted to death before, if you think that your life before was just wonderful and Jesus has just given you kind of like an insurance policy and now you don't have to worry about heaven and you can go back to enjoying things the way it was before you met Jesus, boy, you didn't get changed. You have not experienced the true life of God. And I think that there's a lot of people today that are just religious that are just going through the motions. They call themselves Christians, but they aren't truly changed. And so there isn't a distinct difference before they're born again and, and uh, after born again experience. You know, I got born again when I was eight years old. And I've never gone out and committed all of the bad sins that people talk about. And yet at eight years of age, there was a change on the inside of me like that. The next day at school, I wasn't laughing at the jokes that I used to laugh at. I was different. And my friends, eight years old, third grade, came up and said, what happened to you? There was a change. I knew that I was different. You know what? There's a change that takes place. These are some powerful truths. We were dead in our sins. If you didn't understand that, and if you haven't experienced a, uh, a quickening, a being made alive in comparison to what you have, then I wonder if you seriously got changed. There's a change that takes place. And it says you have been quickened together with him and he has forgiven you all trespasses. Boy, that's significant right there. And most people just, you know, glide through this and don't think about it. They think, well, that means all of my trespasses in the past. Nope, the scripture teaches in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. I've taught on this recently on our television program, so I won't go back through it. But Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, verse 15, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, 10 and 14, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23, all say that our sins have been forgiven, past, present, and even future sins. All sins. Not the ones that you've already committed only, but the ones you haven't even committed yet. All of your sins have been forgiven. You are sanctified and perfected forever in the spirit realm. Boy, if you don't have that revelation, you ought to get some of my teaching where I teach on that. But that is a powerful truth. These are just, these statements are nearly too good to be true. That's the gospel. This is awesome to think that we were dead, but now we're alive through Jesus. And all of our sins, past, present, and even ones we haven't committed yet, have already been forgiven. Boy, what an astounding fact that is. If you could meditate on that, it'd change your life. And here's the verse that I've been working up to. Actually, it's the next two verses I've been working up to all week long. In verse 14, it says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The handwriting of ordinances that he's talking about is the Old Testament law. Now, some people may disagree with that, but I could verify that if I had time. There's many scriptures. One of them that's very clear, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, it says that the ministry of death written and engraven in stones is ready to pass away. It's the only ministration of death that was written and engraven in stones was the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses, and it says it's passed away. It was nailed to the cross. This handwriting of ordinances was nailed to the cross. All of the law was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And therefore, you do not have to fulfill the law anymore. Now, there's still great benefit in, in uh, living morally and living holy as much as you possibly can. But it's not how you relate to God. We now relate to God through Jesus. 
And that's the only thing. It's not Jesus plus doing all of these good works. No, Jesus came, and if you accept Jesus, you get born again totally on the basis of what he did for you and not what you do for him. And then look at this in verse 15. It says, and having spoiled. Again, notice the past tense of this. It's all in the past. This is already done. You don't have to pray, oh, God, spoil the principalities and powers. Oh, God, overcome the devil for me. God's already done this, having spoiled principalities and powers. Remember up in verse 8, I said that the word spoil there wasn't talking about like fruit spoils, food spoils, but it's talking about you go conquer an enemy and then you strip them of everything of value, their garments, their sword, their gold, their silver, anything that's of worth. You take the spoils of battle. So this is what it's saying here, that having spoiled principalities and powers, Jesus stripped Satan and all of the demonic host of anything of value, any authority, any power that they had. Jesus stripped them naked. He took everything from them. And it says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. Did you know the word that, the Greek word that was show here, it literally means an exhibit. It's the root word that we get our English word exhibition or exhibit from. And I don't know if you had to do this, but I remember in high school that we had to go catch these bugs, beetles, butterflies, you know, all of these insect type uh, animals. You would, um, I don't know, somehow or another formaldehyde or something, you'd, some kind of, I forgot what we used, but anyway, we'd somehow or another uh, gas them and kill them, and then we would stick a pen through them and put them on a piece of poster board, and underneath you had to write their scientific name down, and you had to turn this in as your science project. And uh, you made an exhibit of them, an exhibition. And this is the way that I picture what this says about the devil, that having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. I can just see the devil with one of those nails that nailed Jesus to the cross going right through his heart, and he's impaled on the cross, man, just hanging there like a bug with, you know, the name under him. Used to be God of the world. Used to be prince of the power of the air. And, man, I, I, that's the way I pictured Satan, is being impaled to the cross, being exhibited as a defeated foe. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And then that last phrase right there where it says, triumphing over them in it, this comes from a Greek word that was actually a military term referring to what was called a triumphant procession. In the Roman you know, military, when they would go out and conquer an enemy, what they would do is they would take the most ranking, the high ranking officer, if it was the king, if it was a general or whatever, the highest rank of the person that they had conquered was, they would take them and they would strip them naked. They would cut off both thumbs and both big toes, the symbolism being that if you don't have a thumb, you can't grab a sword, you can't hold a bow, you can't do anything, you can't fight. If you don't have any big toes, you can't run, you can't pursue anybody. And the symbolism was that this showed the people that, you know what, never again will this person be able to hold a sword, Never again would they ever be able to pursue you. If they had any ability to do anything, they never would have allowed themselves to have been captured and stripped naked and paraded in this parade. The Romans would literally take this person, strip them naked, cut off their thumbs or toes, and then either uh, drag them behind a horse or a chariot in a parade through the streets of the city to show the Roman people you never have to be afraid of this person again. Don't let anybody come tell you that he's going to come terrify you, that he's going to come conquer your village, overcome you in any way, because if this person had the ability to do anything, they never would have allowed this triumphant procession. Well, that's powerful. And you know, I don't... You know, there are some people that the way they dress, they project an image. You know, I remember when I was drafted and went into the military that this was back in the 60s. There was people that were wearing these afros, 
And you know, an afro just says something about you. And then you have all of this jewelry and then the clothes. You know, today they have the gangbangers or the people that wear certain types of colors and they use all of these clothes and their jewelry and their hair and their piercings and all of these kind of things. And what it does, it projects an image. But it was so funny to me because when we got drafted, we went over in Dallas, Texas to the AFES building. There was hundreds of people who had been drafted. And they were running us through there like cattle. And they didn't have time to give you personal treatment and do things. Uh, this, this may amaze some of you, but they honestly stripped, I mean hundreds of us, they just stripped you totally naked. They buzzed your head. They shaved all of your hair off. They took off all of your uh, jewelry and all of your piercings or whatever that you had. And you know what? It, when you are stripped naked and your head is buzzed, you can't tell the banker from the gangster. <laughs> it was to me so funny. Some of these people came in and they were these tough guys and the afros and all these things and they buzzed their head, strip them naked. And you know what? When you're standing there naked next to somebody else, you just, it's a humiliating experience. You have no persona. When you get beyond our own clothes and all of the things that we use to project who we are and to make statements and to do stuff. You know what? When you're stripped naked, you just look just like the guy next to you. It's a humiliating experience. And see, when you took one of these generals or kings that used to wear their gold and their, their you know, all of their clothes that projected that they were somebody special, and when you stripped them naked, did you know what? It just showed the people that were at the parade that, you know what, they are a nobody. They are no different than you and me. There's nothing special about them. It just brings them down to a level. And so you parade them through this parade, stripped naked, drugged behind a horse or a chariot, no thumbs, no big toes. You, the purpose of this was to give assurance to those Romans that, you know what, you never have to be afraid of this person again. And this is what it's saying. This is the symbolism. This is what this word picture means about the devil, that Jesus spoiled principalities and powers. He overcame them, stripped them of everything that was good. He made a show of them openly, made an exhibit. He impaled Satan on the cross. Satan is a defeated foe. He's nailed to the cross. He doesn't have any power to do anything. All he is is all mouth. You know, if you use the illustration of the symbolism of a lion over in 1 Peter chapter 5, that our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. If you use that symbolism, Jesus defanged him, took all of his teeth out, declawed him. He can't scratch you. He can't bite you. He's just all mouth. All the devil can do is gum you. Amen. <laughs> he just talks. He yells at you. He's telling you lies and deception. And only if you yield to his lies and deceptions does he have any power over you. See, this is what he did. He, he made a show of him. He impaled him on the cross. And then he had this triumphant procession, this parade through the pages of the Bible that show that Satan is a defeated foe, that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And just throughout the pages of the Bible, you have statement after statement after statement that, statement that Satan no longer is the prince of the power of the air. He no longer is the God of this world. He's been dethroned. He's been defanged, declawed. Jesus triumphed over him. Man, this ought to give assurance to all of us. But you know what the problem is? Most of the body of Christ has missed the parade. We haven't seen this. You know that the church as a whole, or let me, let me say it this way, that religion, religion has glorified the devil. Religion has imputed unto the devil powers that he doesn't really have. And there are many Christians today who before getting born again didn't even give the devil the time of day didn't even actually acknowledge that the devil existed. Now, I acknowledge that he exists and he is a factor, but the, the thing that Satan is doing, it, he doesn't have any superior authority or power. What he's got is deception. And Satan is a factor. He's out trying to deceive people. And so I acknowledge that he exists, but I believe that Satan can do nothing to us without our consent and cooperation. And that's the reason that if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And I'm telling you the truth is that there has been a triumphant procession. Satan has been stripped naked. 
Satan has lost any ability that he ever had. He can't fight anymore. He can't pursue you. Satan doesn't have the power to make you do anything. But you know what? You've got to see this parade. You've got to get an image of this. You've got to see yourself as the victor. And when somebody comes along, when it's Satan or your own thoughts, we've all been corrupted in the way that we think. And in some cases, it's not even demonic activity. The devil just plants a thought and now he can go on vacation and you're doing a great job of destroying yourself. You're afraid of sickness, afraid of failure, afraid of everything. And you've been taught to fear and, and you are just doing a bang up job of operating in fear. But the truth is that there's really nothing to be afraid of. Satan has been defeated. Satan is destroyed. And we just need to get a revelation of this and start standing on what has already been purchased for us. I'll tell you, this is powerful. You know, this series that I've been doing for the last five weeks, basically this is the point that I've been trying to get across, is what is God's part? What is our part? I've been teaching that the Lord has already, as, as we've read right here in Colossians chapter 2, He has already quickened us, raised us from the dead, has already forgiven us all sins. The Lord has already done His part. The Lord has already provided everything. We don't need to beseech Him and pray and beg and plead with God to come heal, deliver, set free. He's already done it. He's put that resurrection power for, uh, on the inside of every born-again believer. You've already got it. You don't have to plead with God to do it. You need to find out what you've got, and then, that's God's part, is to provide it, to put it on the inside of us. But now it's our part to stand up and recognize that the only God's not going to keep us from prospering and living a victorious life. That's His will for us. We have an enemy out there, but now our enemy has been impaled. Our enemy has been spoiled. He's been made an exhibit. He has been triumphed over. Jesus has completely stripped him naked, has exposed him as the liar, as the deceiver, as the nothing that he is. That's already been done. And now our part is to stand up and quit being intimidated and quit letting the devil steal him from you. Quit let the... Don't let the devil make you sick. Don't let him steal from you financially, emotionally. Don't let him destroy relationships. Take your authority. Get angry, not at people, but at the devil. Take your authority and power and read the devil the riot act. And if you resist the devil, James 4, 7 says, he will flee from you. Boy, that is powerful. There's lots of people watching this program that you know that the devil exists, and you are trying to get victory over him, but you're doing it passively, approaching it as you're powerless. Oh, God, would you please do something? You need to recognize that God's already done it. The triumphant procession, this parade, has already taken place. You just missed it. I'm telling you about it. You can go to the Word and see it for yourself, and then stand up and take your authority and refuse to allow the devil to steal from you any longer. You know, I've got some more to share on this, and I'm going to share that tomorrow on our program, so I encourage you to listen in then. But remember that tomorrow's going to be my last day to offer you this album that I've entitled, The Word Became Flesh, and I believe that you need this. If you don't need it, which I believe you do, but even if you think you don't, I encourage you to get it so that you could share it with someone else. It would be a big help to you. Listen as our announcer gives you the information about how to receive these materials and then call or write today. And join me again tomorrow as we conclude this teaching on The Word Became Flesh. Andrew's five-part teaching titled, The Word Became Flesh, was captured live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available in a CD or DVD album for a gift of 16 pounds or more. For the CD album, ask for number T1057 or request the DVD series T3202. You can also get Andrew's teaching as seen on TV by asking for DVD album number T1057 when you send a gift of 16 pounds or more. The fifth teaching in the audio CD album is also available for a donation of three pounds or more. We encourage everyone to send a gift, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth teaching free of charge. 
Request teaching TC26 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. The best way to reach us is through our website. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. Again, that's 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 441922-473-300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. I'd like to encourage you to pray about our Karis Bible Colleges. You know, the things that I'm sharing here on our television program are just the tip of the iceberg. If this has helped you, there is so much more. The Word of God would transform your life. And most people just don't know where to get started. They don't know how to do it. That's what our Karis Bible College is all about. In two years' time, we will take you through the Word that I guarantee you, you'll come out on the other side having witnessed this triumphant procession of, of Jesus' victory over the devil. We have information on your screen. You can call us. You can inquire about our Karis Bible Colleges. I believe they'd be a real blessing to you, so please call or write today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Kampala, Uganda, July 11th and 12th. He'll also be in the Northwest Province of South Africa on July 20th and July 21st through the 23rd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. This is Andrew Womack inviting all of our people watching in Uganda to come and join me for a special series of meetings on July the 11th and 12th. We're going to be holding these meetings at Hotel Africana in Kampala, Uganda. This will be my second trip there, and I tell you, I was so touched and impressed by my first trip that I am really looking forward to coming back. I'd love to have you come and be a part of these meetings. We'll be having our services from 9 till noon and then 2 till 5 on each day, July the 11th and 12th. That's a Friday and Saturday. And uh, we saw great miracles when I was there before. And I know that the Word of God is confirmed with signs and wonders. So we're going to see miracles. We're going to see people's lives changed by the Word going to be a very special time of ministry. So don't forget to join me in Kampala, Uganda, July the 11th and 12th. That's Friday and Saturday at Hotel Africana right there in Kampala, Uganda. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more gospel truth. Jesus could do no mighty works in his hometown because of those people's unbelief. And if Jesus couldn't do mighty works and he was functioning perfectly in the power of God, well, then I can't do mighty works if the other person isn't willing to believe.